Hi folks, thanks for tuning in. This is Mike Snett, the Office for Truth program. So as you saw on the cover, I'm going to be addressing the Calvary Chapel leadership. Calvary Chapel is shutting down. That's where they're headed to. It's a dead church. The Lord's not there. That's what he's doing. I know he's doing that through me and other people. And so in this particular video, I'm going to be discussing those various uh, pastors you see on the uh, cover of the thumbnail because those are kind of the main people, the faces of the organization. I know there's 2,000 Calvary chapels. I know there's all these other people, but these are the people I've had experience with and ran into. Physically, gone to their churches, stood out there, and, and other interactions with these people. So that's why we're doing those particular churches. So let's get into it. Besides that, if you get bored with one pastor, because I'm going to go through all of them. There's six of them there. And it's kind of a dark video. Skeletons and skulls and kind of this ugly perception of these people because that's how it's viewed. It's evil. There's something wrong. It's not right. And that's what I'm going to be explaining to you. But if you get bored with one pastor, skip on to somebody else because I'm going to be going through all of them. So we got here, we got Chuck Smith. He's kind of the high priest here. And you can kind of see in the little picture I have there of him, kind of ominous and, and uh, weird. But that's how he's the leader of this organization. Now remember, it was Chuck Smith. Here's why he's the problem of Calvary Chapel. It was Chuck Smith who brought John Corson there to come on staff from my old church at the Applegate Christian Fellowship, who was in the midst of being investigated, I repeat, in the midst of being investigated for all that crooked land issues and the land things they were going through, the fraud, the corruption, the, the evil practices they were doing in Applegate with some crooked county being covered up by some sort of crooked media. But in the midst of that, John, uh, Chuck Smith brings him down there to come on staff. He doesn't care. He knew all about that stuff. But what Chuck Smith was doing, as I said before, is reloading talent. People leave. He wants people around to be knows and trusts. So he played on John Corson's thing that he thought he was going to take over. Because John Corson told us he's going to take over all of Calvary Chapel. See you later. And so when he gets down there, no, he's just standing at a door like every other pastor. Because it's Chuck Smith's church. But Chuck Smith didn't care. So when I show up there a year later or so, what does Chuck Smith do? And, the, and Brian Brodersons and the Mike Wingers and these other people do. Well, they get John Corson out of there because he was a joke. They didn't care about him. No more protection. They didn't think about him because it was crooked and I come down there. Because remember, they didn't factor me into their scenarios. Here I just show up, all the newspaper articles. Because again, Southern Oregon to Southern Cal is a long distance. So Chuck Smith was a part of that. Plus, all I got, I got arrested two times while Chuck Smith was the pastor. He instituted these two arrests led by Craig. The two times while Chuck Smith was the pastor, he instituted these two arrests led by Craig Hoffman and the security team, Chris, Pete, others. They led two investigations. One, I got assaulted and thrown in the street. The other one, they just made up because he had a bunch of crooked cops showing up for Calvary, for Apple, for Calvary Chapel because they just have this broad influence in the cities and states that they're in. So he was orchestrated two of my arrests, brought on a crooked pastor who was deceptive down there and didn't care. So Chuck Smith is part of the problem. Chuck Smith's gone now, and so we'll move on from Chuck Smith. Just one aspect of it, guilty. So we move on to John Corson, of course. He comes down there on staff, knowing he's being investigated by this crooked uh, even though the county was crooked, they're still investigating them. Kind of a flunky investigation. I agree, but still, um, they were doing an investigation. The bribery, the corruption, the influence peddling. And remember at the time, Kelly, Hasman, Kelly Rasmussen, the, the later on convicted child predator, hadn't gone out there and harmed kids. And so he didn't have that yet that was going to affect him. He just has his own corruption scandal because he couldn't get stuff the right way. Before, and when you, comment on this, when you comment on these videos, talk to me about the illegal stuff. Not them sharing John 3.16 and talking about our Christ we follow, who doesn't cheat and bribe and corrupt and terrorize, as John Corson and his church did down there, or over there in, in Applegate in Southern Oregon. So that's what John Corson's aspect is, and kind of that evil-handed way he's been in Southern Oregon. We see the cover-up later on of the child predator, youth pastor Kelly Rasmus, and his own son and the rape accusations. 
So see, John Corson has a lot of all these problems, but he's still kind of a main face of the organization. And then I remind you, later on, these people started to embrace his son. It's funny, they run the dad out of there, but they embrace the son, Ben Corson, later on. But we'll move on from John Corson. He's a joke. He's not there anymore. His church has been shrunk down to a handful of people because of all the crookedness and the scandals. And uh, John Corson himself isn't even welcome there because it's so embarrassing for what he's done. And he's been diminished. And he's only 70 years old. Or he's just diminished. So you watch his videos. He's tired. Uh, droopy face, tired, no energy. Because he's just been... He's just simply having things taken away. He's going to have more stuff taken from him, by the way, as time goes by. We'll move on to Brian Broderson. Brian Broderson was the, on staff there and a pastor when John Corson got there. Now, remember, Brian Broderson eventually took over for Chuck Smith. Uh, he married into the family, I believe, one of his daughters. But he eventually took over. So it was him and John kind of dueling when John Corson was there for a while about who was going to kind of ascend to the throne. But Brian Broderson was instrumental in getting John Corson out of there because he saw him as his main competition to taking over that church. And so it was Brian Broderson that fueled all the stuff that got John Corson out of there because John Cor it was embarrassing, but they were trying to kind of just play it off because it was just me standing out there telling some folks. But Brian Broderson, kind of behind his back in the church politics, kind of stabbed him in the back by pushing that narrative that we have to get John out of here because this guy's bringing attention that we don't want. So Brian Broder, so these aren't friends, you know, these are cutthroat people who want to run this thing and he, he, it worked because he ascended to the throne. He was on staff also when I got those arrests that took place that were um, made up arrests. I still have the witnesses at the office building and other places that are going to come help me. So when I'm out there in, front, out in public, those people are going to come for me. And you see, Brian Broderson, who's now the church, is going to have to explain. What did Brian Broderson do later on? He just went and got Ben Corson. So he doesn't care about what people do or don't do. He's as crooked as they come. It's just this strange kind of... A lot of these Calvary chapels kind of toss Ben Corson around. You know, they got something from him and kind of brought him around for a while. Now he's gone, of course, because he's all used up. And so, but Brian Broderson is instrumental in that. He's just as evil as the rest of these people, as you can see in the video that I made of him and that kind of picture I pictured him as. Um, there's something wrong with the man. Let's move on. Greg Laurie. Done other videos on Greg Laurie. You can see there kind of this maniacal person that he is. He was another one instrumental in this cover-up of the Corson family. Of course, he's been covering up all these years because he keeps, he has Ben Corson who he's just turned his church over. And, and done all these things for. So it's kind of a pay-to-play system between Ben Corson and Greg Laurie. Some sort of affair they had, some sort of weird, strange relationship that they've had that doesn't work anymore, of course, because when he tried to shout out to him going and preaching after he beat some rape charge, people just hammered him because, and he said, I got to get away from the guy, you know. Um, ben Corson's still trying to work through Greg Laurie and others to kind of get back in the good graces of Calvary Chapel, but that's what I'm trying to keep the pressure on them. Greg Laurie also has all that weak, false stuff about the rapture. He's like Chuck Smith. Like Chuck Smith predicted the rapture in 1981. Greg Laurie was a champion of that stuff and, and does that kind of stuff. You wonder what spirit are they listening to if they quote, if they make up the, when the rapture is going to happen. You know, Mike Winger. I don't know if you ever watched his videos. That guy's another pathetic Calvary Chapel pastor. But he had to explain it away about Chuck Smith. And some stupid thing about, yeah, he did predict it. and Who knows what, what they were doing there. But Greg Laurie has that same kind of thing, the way that he does his, his routine. And he is just part of the cover-up, that strange cover-up like the rest of the Calvary Chapel, big faces. And they just feed into that. And he's just a champion of Chuck Smith when he's alive and dead. Because they just, that's how they, they're just, they keep something going. It's kind of strange. We move on from him. Because I don't want to take up too much time. And then we got Skip Isaac, of course. I went to his church. And it was Skip Isaac who orchestrated a couple of those arrests. One of them was for his buddy Franklin Graham who was preaching because he wanted to demonstrate something to Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham's a joke, just like Skip Isaac and crooked as them. The fact that the man's even around those people tells you everything you need to know. Um, is also, Raul Reese was one, my second arrest was because Raul Reese was there. Because 
What um, Skip Heisler likes to do is he likes to brag and command the police how I can get them to arrest people. I know how to do that. I can get people to get arrested because I have power. So when Franklin Graham was there, he got me arrested. When Raul Reese was there, he got me arrested. For what? Standing there holding a the sign. They don't like being criticized, so they go to jail. That's, not, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a mark against them in the Lord's eyes of sending Christians to jail because you don't want to be criticized. It was Skip Isaac who took all that money, cheated all those people all those years, cheated them, took all that money, stuffed his pockets. He wanted to go live his dream life on other people's dimes, and uh, he didn't care about that. Then when it didn't work out, he brought Franklin Graham back, fired the other guy, and I got to get my job back. He's just as crooked as the rest of these people. Remember, you don't put people in jail because you're being criticized. So the Lord's not going to go along with that. Doesn't care about that. Doesn't care about a Skip Isaac being offended. He's not with these people. You can think they are because they stand on the stage or because you yourselves go to these places and they preach John 3.16 on the stage. I got a different message, don't I? I got a different experience with them. So as time goes by, that's not going to be the counter they preach the gospel. They're going to have to explain what they did off the stage. Let's go to the last person, Raul Reese. Raul Reese came from this. Raul Reese's whole background was is he was into this karate judo stuff and some sort of black magic, running the streets, acting like he's beating up people. Anyway, I showed up at his church, and he thought that when I showed up at his, now remember his is in Diamond Bar, California. Where do I stand, though, with my sign criticizing him? down there by Golden Springs Highway, about 400 yards from the building. So he thought that when I showed up, he could command the Orange County sheriffs to come and arrest me because he's got Skip Isaac to it. But this is SoCal, and you're a nobody in SoCal. Albuquerque is a small town, but uh, SoCal, he couldn't, even, no, even though he's one of the pastor's chaplains for the sheriff's department, he, didn't, he doesn't command anybody. But he came down there because they couldn't do anything because he told them, Pastor Reese, he's 400 yards down the road. We can't do anything you got to go out there and get into a confrontation and see if something happens, and maybe we can arrest him. So he does that. He had his wife's blessing. Now remember, this is the wife and his children that he was going to kill. That was his claim to fame. He was going to kill his wife and kids. Why? Who knows? But he was going to kill them, and somehow she prayed, and they became Christians, and now they've changed all, all these years. Well, that's not the royal rice that I saw. The one at, at, Alba, at Albuquerque... At, Albuquerque Calvary Chapel was going to do speak at their car show my first my second arrest there He thought I could get arrested and go to jail because I had him on my sign Raul Reese imposter He thinks he can't be criticized because he's been on that leadership of Albuquerque Calvary Chapel just going along with all the crooked stuff. They're all just buddies So now I show up at his church and he thought he could do the same thing. Well, the police said you're no we can't do anything so he thought it was, his wife thought it was a good idea that he goes out there. Now, when he stood out there in front of me to get into a confrontation, remember what I'm doing. I'm holding a sign. That's all that I'm doing. There's no weapons, guns. There's no aggressive behavior. I'm holding a sign. So he comes out of the car. You know he's only about five feet tall? Do you know how much they stretch the story of how this guy's some tough guy beating up people on the streets? Maybe kids are homeless people. But he's like five feet tall. I'm 5'8". I'm not that... I mean, I was like, give me a break. But I'm just standing there, and I know he knows karate and all that stuff. What was he going to do, folks? Was he going to karate chop me? I'm holding a sign. Was he going to hit me with one of his swords or knives or, or do some kick or, or hold? He got out of the car screaming, and then he realized that it was daylight, and everybody's around because he does stuff in the darkness. He picks on women children and terrifies them. That's why he does all those knife shows and, and sword shows where he does the death throws and the death grips and, and gets in his clown outfit because he likes to terrify little children, some sort of thing of don't mess with me. But when he gets out into public, that's a joke, of course. There's some 60-year-old man who's going to come out to a guy holding a sign. What was he going to do? Well, he, he, he had to back up and slow up because what's he going to do? So, but I mean, think about his wife. You know, She thought that was a good idea. I got arrested. She thought that was a good idea. Now I show up here and she thinks that's a good idea. Remember, these people have changed. But yet they, they think they're going to go out and harm somebody on the sidewalk. Like, ask her, well, what was he going to do out there on the sidewalk? Was he going to beat him up? What did you think was going to happen? What does he do? He does nothing. He has to stop. He has to collect himself and stop because he, he went out there in anger. So he hasn't changed at all. You know, Whenever you hear about people changing when they were younger, well, you just simply can't do the same things when you're younger. You just carry the same mentality. He just carries that anger in a cavern chapel. It's the perfect place for abuse and anger 
in a different way to have a feed your appetite. And so he found a home there. So he tries to back up and play it off, and then he just leaves. So he's just another pathetic nothing. And he's just another indication. They have their fake act on the stage, but see, I see them differently. You're not going to take away from me my experiences with them because you went to a building and they spoke something on a stage. You responded to Jesus Christ. You didn't respond to these people using the stuff of Christ. So Raul Reese is an imposter. There are all these imposters, hypocrites, actors, as Christ would say, in their walk in this scam they call Calvary Chapel. That's why Calvary Chapel is going to shut down because of the scam of the place that it is. And pretty soon they're going to have to give an account of what they're doing. And the excuse won't be, but I'm on a stage sharing John 3.16, so therefore it's okay. So this is just kind of, a, kind of a long video, but I'm just kind of sharing my experience. These are experiences I had with these people. And it's, it's to inform you, because remember here, this isn't about, I don't have doctrines or groups of folks. I want, I want to protect you, and you come here and, and you have good stuff. These people are evil people. And there's something horrible about them, uh, malevolent about them behind closed doors. And that's just an act. And so again, uh, thanks for watching. Um, I really appreciate it. This was Mike Stinnett in the Office for Truth.